Rape and Manipulation in the Garden of Eden As we know from before, the AIF, and almost all other beings, are interdimensional and know how to shapeshift. How this is done has been described in many of my previous papers. Shapeshifting was also what Lord Anki was going to use in order to get into what once was Prince Ninurta's paradise on Earth, his Garden of Eden. Greek mythology tells the Artemis story in quite some detail, so we are going to borrow from there to show what Enki did in the Garden of Eden. He patiently waited until a few ladies of fire showed up by the riverbed and quickly cloaked himself as Artemis, the mother goddess. In Greek mythology, the being who cloaked himself was Zeus, who we have proven in paper 2, and elsewhere, to be Lord Enki. Prince Ninurta was the one who had been given the responsibility for the living library and the Nimlu, the androgynous human race, which the goddess was very proud of. Also, as the Artemis story tells us, Artemis was very protective of the chastity of her nymphs and was angered when they didn't keep their purity. In other words, the Lus, short for Nimlu, were like the jewel in her crown. Prince Lucifer, as Enki, cloaked as Artemis, now used all of his actor skills in smooth talking to convince the nymphs that he was the goddess herself, who had returned to help her creation in this hopeless situation. He looked at them and found them enormously fair with their black skin, long red hair, glowing like fire, and their slender, perfect bodies. He couldn't help but admire this beautiful creation. Being bluffed by this false Artemis, the nymphs showed him the way into Eden. They removed a spell. Enki was making sure he understood how it was done, and led him into the most beautiful paradise that had ever been created. Even Enki was stunned when he saw the pure beauty in there. Clear, blue rivers were running through what seemed to be an endless landscape of forests, mountains, waterfalls, and wonderfully created gardens, with birds and animals in abundance. None of them bothered the other. There were no predators and there was no prey. All living things could still obtain their life energy from the sunlight. However, most beautiful of all were the nymphs, the primordial L.U. Acute S. Enki looked around and saw that there were no males here. These ladies of fire were truly androgynous. However, this didn't mean they couldn't have sex with the male, and this is what the true Artemis meant when she said that she wanted them to keep their purity. In the mythology, there was one of the nymphs whose name was Callisto, and in Anki's eyes, she was the most attractive and adorable of all the nymphs he encountered in the Garden of Eden. So, as he'd done so often before, Anki used what he had between his legs, his serpent, and raped Callisto. Artemis became furious and appeared in the shape of a bear, blaming the rape on Callisto, and wanted to kill her, thus, he had created the most horrible sin, he had raped one of the goddess' most precious nymphs. Not only that, his rape impregnated Callisto, and she bore him a child, the first child in the Garden of Eden that was born by male impregnation. The myth says further that the real Artemis became furious and appeared in the shape of a bear, bear being a symbol for Orion, blamed the rape on Callisto, and wanted to kill her apparently thinking that Callisto had intentionally decided to lose her purity, however, Zeus, Enki interfered at the last moment, throwing Callisto up in the stars, where she got her own constellation, Ursa Major, the Greater Bear. This is another interesting distortion of original records because, first, Ursa Major already belonged to the Orion Empire at the time, as we have seen when we had discussed the Galactic Wars and Enki would never be able to confront the goddess and come out as the winner. Also, from having done my homework on the mother goddess and her basic character, she would never blame Callisto for being raped. However, as we shall see, this is a typical Enki trait. More than once has he protected rapists against their victims, something we will see in later papers, as well. Therefore, from doing my research, I find it much more evident that this part was inserted later by Enki himself. I am not stating this because I want to defend one being against another, but because I have learned what the characteristics of these beings are. 
by raping Callisto, he had now polluted this pure goddess bloodline with a semen, and he now knew his way into Eden. The magic and the spells that were used to protect Ninurta's paradise had now been decoded by Enki, and he understood the magic that was being used. Thus, he had a free passageway into the garden. Of course, the Artemis story is also a variety of the story about Adam and Eve, where Eve, Callisto, was seduced by Satan in the Garden of Eden, where Satan showed up as a snake, or should we say, with his snake, and seduced, red raped, Eve. There was no Adam at that time. The rest of the story is partly told in Genesis in the Bible, with the horrendous crime excluded. Enki, the serpent, or Satan, in the Bible, in disguise of YHWH, Jehovah, Artemis, killed one of the nymphs, and stole a rib from her body, where after he snuck out of the garden, the rib, of course, contained the DNA of the Lady of Fire, and he and his consort, Isis, who was a highly trained scientist on her own merit, trained by her father, Ninurta, planned to use their own DNA to create more workers. Although Enki also had a much more hideous plan, which will be obvious in time, Enki was very careful so that the homicide in the garden would not be revealed to anybody, except for Isis. He told her that he wanted to create a hybrid race of workers, by crossing them blue genes with those of existing apes, who had evolved on their own here on Gaia. Then they had to dumb them down by leaving most of their DNA dormant, so the workers would only be intelligent enough to understand elders, but not intelligent enough to comprehend who they were, and where they came from. Genetic Manipulation, The Mars Laboratories, and Con Enlil's Protest Lord Anki could not forget the attractive nymphs in the garden, and every so often he sneaked in there when he wanted to play. The nymphs of course knew who he was by now, but they were peaceful beings, and although they were the first shamans on Gaia, they didn't know how to protect themselves from Anki's manipulative ways and the manner in which he managed to get to what he wanted. Edin, which had had its own, separate frequency level, isolated from the rest of the world since the AIF came, now found its frequency level decreasing, and it became harder and harder to maintain the magic of the mountain paradise which Ninurta had created. The last resort of what once was a planetary golden age was about to be utterly destroyed. I can't help but drawing parallels to J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, when the elves left Lothlorien and Middle-earth. The once so magical forests and rivers declined and merged with the new age of human rulership. The leaves fell from the trees, rivers dried out, and visitors to the once so mighty elf kingdom now found themselves walking in an abandoned forest with very few remnants of the glory that once was. By interfering with the development of the Nimlu, and Ninurta Zedin, a deep sadness fell over Mother Gaia, and from there on, the world would never be the same. In the heavens, rumors came to Khan Enlil and Queen Nin of what was happening on Gaia. There was really no way for Enki to hide what he was doing because Mother Earth, who is a manifestation of the goddess, knows what is happening on her own planet, and Enki should have known better. Deep inside, perhaps, he didn't care if they knew or not, he may have felt safe as long as he had the nymphs he could use as shields, if necessary. Khan and Lil got furious when he heard about what Enki had done, and here Zechariah Sitchin describes well what happened next. Enlil objected to Enki's plan. Don't create an Abirin, ape men slave class here on Earth? Enlil reminded Enki, on our planet, Nibiru, slavery has long ago been abolished, tools are slaves, not other beings, Ninurta added that to get gold better, Enki should make machines not slaves. Enki replied, Earthlings will create will be helpers, not slaves. Enlil still protested, hybrid cloning was forbidden in the rules of planet to planet journeying. Enki's response the team won't create a new species, Erectus is our the genetic ancestor, he evolves into us, Homo sapiens, sapiens, the humans of Nibiru, 
we'll just speed him along a few million years. This is a quite revealing part of Sitchin's interpretations, and it deserves a few comments. The readers, who have read Sitchin, or my first level of learning, know about Sitchin's version of what Nibiru was and his interpretation that all the Anunnaki beings came from this one planet. Doing a little deeper research, we discover that this is a misleading presentation of what really happened. It becomes obvious when studying the mythology that is available to us, and I have also had the privilege to communicate with star beings who at times have helped me by pointing out the more likely path. Nevertheless, if we look at the above quote, we clearly see that Enlil, Khan, who has been accused of being the driving force behind creating a human slave race, in fact, verbally objected to Anki's plans, and in reality, he was very upset. In Sitchin's version, Anki replies that Earthlings, a very diminishing and intimidating term for humanity, will be helpers, not slaves. Right there, it clearly shows Anki's deceptive manners. History has showed us that he indeed created slaves and not helpers, because humans were manipulated into doing the AIF's hard work without getting any comparable rewards for it. In fact, these helpers had to work day and night in Lord Anki's service. Channeled entities, such as the Pleiadians, pretend to go along with defending human rights on this subject but always add that it's a co-creation, and that it was a choice. Not listening to anybody but just by observing, does it look like we had a choice in the matter? Not to me, anyway. A co-creation? Why would human souls agree to becoming slaves? Who wants to be a slave? As the readers can see, it doesn't make much sense, does it? Is it a co-creation if one part of the creative forces is manipulated into doing something? Not in my book. When Enlil still protests, Enki continues using his manipulative manners. To be able to really understand this text, we need to exchange Nibiru with Orion under some circumstances, such as when it comes to slavery. Slavery, says Enlil, has been forbidden in Orion for a long time, something Enki is well aware of. Although he believes he has a privilege by using the ladies of fire as shields, he still has some kind of respect left for his parents because he believes he'd rather have them on his side in this matter than to just go ahead, not caring about their opinions. Thus, he continues, saying that he will not really create a new race, he will just speed up the evolution of Homo erectus with a few million years. This, of course, as we know, was not what he really planned, and it was not at all what he actually did. The easiest way to spot a deceiver is to see if he or she walks the talk, or not. Enki certainly did not. Bringing up Nibiru and its need for gold to save its atmosphere couldn't be less of Enlil's concern. Nibiru was thrown out of orbit during the Syrian Wars, and the inhabitants chose to side with the rebels. I seriously doubt that Enki even brought up Nibiru when communicating with the Orion Council. It is more likely something that Sitchin put there to fit into his story. The communication back and forth between Enki and the Orion Council, here led by Khan Enlil, ends with the Council voting for Enki's plan. This is all according to Sitchin, of course. Therefore, let's think that over for a minute. Why would the Council of Orion vote for Enki's plan to create a human hybrid, whether it's from the DNA of the Nimlu? or any other beings, when cloning and hybridization is strictly forbidden in Orion. Is it because Nibiru's atmosphere needs gold? Of course not, this is just a cover story. In reality, there is no way that Khan Enlil, Queen Nin, or anybody else on the council would agree to genetically engineer a new species to become slave workers, this goes against all morals and ethics of the Empire. This is also true for a few other reasons. First, this is a living library, and it is supposed to evolve into something great all by itself, without interference from outside. This has been stated over and over, not only by me, but by many others who have done their homework. Hence, there is no chance that Enki got approval to mess with the living library. Second, Genetic engineering and genetic manipulation have nothing to do with creation at all. Yes, 
it is possible to use nanotechnology and subquantum physics in order to engineer, or manipulate, a species. It is done all the time here on Earth by humans when we breed different animal species with each other in a way that goes against nature. It is also done on humans in secret underground laboratories, in places such as Area 51 and Ulse. When a planet is seeded, it's done without technology, with the assistance of electricity, such as lightning, and bacteria and viruses, brought to the planet by colliding meteorites etc. Technology has very little to do with it. Later in the planet's development, if the creator goddesses want to enhance intelligence, or other traits, into one of the species on the planet, they do so by inserting themselves into those particular beings and engineer them from the inside. No laboratories are needed. Therefore, a much more likely hypothesis is that Khan Enlil and the Council of Orion discovered at least some parts of Enki's plans and loudly protested against them. Enki, however, after having tried to manipulate them without success, went on without their consent, using his consort, Isis, as his co-scientist. Isis, after agreeing to Enki's idea to create a slave race without the consent of the Orion Empire was, of course, no longer on good terms with Orion, and had, in their eyes, really showed her real nature. She continued working with Enki. The reason, as I see it, why Enki has left the above communication in the records is because he wanted future humans to believe that he had Orion's consent to created Homo sapiens sapiens, us, and he did us a favor by speeding up our evolution by millions of years. Nowhere does he mention that there was already an evolved humanoid species on Earth, which he, Enki, utterly destroyed and killed off in the process. As soon as they realized who the wolf in sheep's clothing was, the Namlu tried to flee. They were not safe in the sanctuary anymore. They were cloaking themselves, but were detected. Therefore, they tried to escape by literally going underground, and some of them succeeded in disappearing from Gaia's surface and many of them haven't been seen since then. However, the majority of them were captured and put into slave labor deep down in the mines. This was a huge mistake for many reasons. They were ladies of fire, and their bodies were not built for such hard work. Many of them died down there in the mines, while they were whipped and tortured for not working fast enough. Although it must have happened on occasion, there were so called Enki's loyal supervisors who made sure that the slave drivers were not raping the nymphs. Enki did not want a pure goddess bloodline of the ladies of fire mixed with his original workers. Now, when Enki, as Artemis, had stolen the rib from one of the nymphs, he and his consort could start working. However, they were not alone. Enki had a whole team of scientists brought with him to Gaia, so he set up laboratories both on Gaia and in the underground caverns of Mars. Mars had something which could almost be compared with industrial underground cities, with air trains driving around long distances between different departments that were spread out across these cities. There were not only the underground laboratories, when people lived down there, they had their needs for stores and conveniences, so things were built around that, as well. Nevertheless, everything circled around the genetic laboratories. Other than this, we know the stories of what happened next because I have told them in previous papers. In summary, Enki and Isis experimented a lot before they found a worker that fit their purposes, and while they were at it, they also created hybrids that could work as maids for the gods and as farmers, builders, and much more. Prince Ninurta who had nurtured the original living library for many eons, must have been both devastated and furious when he found out that his own genes, via his daughter, Isis, were used to create mankind. This must have been the ultimate insult to him, not because he had ill feelings toward mankind, but because the manipulators were using his genes to create something that was both illegal and less evolved than what he had helped create in the past. In their attempt to create robust workers, Enki and Isis tried everything from centaurs, minotaurs, to giants, who could lift enormous rocks and stones, but they were not very pleased with their result. 
some of these creatures and monsters couldn't sustain themselves in the third dimensional frequency band, so they suddenly just failed to thrive and died, while others went insane, attacked their supervisors and other workers, and had to be killed on the spot. These races were soon terminated, and new ones were tried in their place. Others didn't fit as mine workers but could be used as giant packing animals, and AIF managers could be seen riding on centaurs around the gigantic mines for some time. Eventually, Enki and Isis decided on humanoids after all. They realized that the humanoid life template was the most reliable and started developing that instead. Eventually, after many discarded prototypes, Enki had a worker ready which was asexual and could not reproduce. This meant that new workers had to be cloned, and they all looked the same. The AIF workers, however, were released from their duties and were happy not having to go down into the mines again. Here I need to fill in that mining operations are not at all unusual in the universe. Almost every star in the universe has planets around them, and these planets are all unique with their own minerals and precious stones in the huge mix. Star races often claim planets with a lot of interesting and attractive resources for themselves and make them their real estate. Then they start mining them and emptying them of resources, which they then sell on the galactic and intergalactic market. Planets with moons also often have these moons mined. However, moons are not as common as people may think. Most of them are artificial in one way or another. They are often satellites brought in from elsewhere in order to stabilize the planet and to keep the planet on a certain orbit around its sun. The AIF did a lot of mining all over our own solar system, particularly on the moons that surround the bigger gas giants. Although most of the mines are abandoned now, there is still some mining going on out there. Whether the AIF used any of the gold to enhance Nibiru's atmosphere or not, I am not sure. If they did, it was just a small amount that went there. What the AIF saw was that Gaia, literally, was an incredible gold mine and had an abundance of other minerals, precious stones, and other useful resources that could be traded on the universal market. Gold in itself, as I've mentioned elsewhere, was used almost like cocaine by the gods. Inhaled correctly, and contrary to cocaine, it increased their lifespan tremendously. It was not only the gold that made them live much longer, however, it was a mix of things, but gold had a lot to do with it. After some time, using the new hybrids in the mining business and elsewhere, it became hard to keep up with creating clones. Slaves sometimes died like flies down in the mines, and the mining managers complained that they couldn't get enough workers. That's when Enki and Isis created Adapa, the hybrid that could reproduce. They were the first male-female human race on Earth. Thus, it can be stated that the goddess created womankind, and Enki and Isis created mankind. The first Adapa had black skin, and the reason for this was twofold. The engineers had used genes from Homo erectus, who were not necessarily black, but the Namlu were. So, by using the DNA of the ladies of fire and Homo erectus and mix from some other star beings, as the legend states, the result became the first human species that could reproduce, and that race was black. Therefore, contrary to what has been said earlier, the black race was here before Anki arrived on Gaia, in the form of the Namlu. Many of us have probably often thought about all these different races of humans here on Earth, some are black. Others are white, red, yellow, brown, or any shade in between. Where do they all come from? In fact, we know that Anki and his AIF have been in charge here for the last half a million years, and during that period. In general, only star races who have had Anki's consent have been allowed to visit Gaia. Therefore, the hypothesis many have that all these races were created because a multitude of beings were here and copulated with mankind, falls on its own merit. Instead, Enki and Isis created variations of the Black Adapa as they went along, and they were used for different purposes. The Black Race was used for mining, in Africa and South America in particular, and then abandoned. A new race, let's say the White Race, 
was created with slightly different DNA mixture and was used for other types of labor. Many America Indian tribes, the Red People, claim that their ancestors come from the Pleiades, while the Dogon tribe in Africa say they had Syrian visitors in the past. Some have suggested that the Asian people have DNA of the greys in them because of the shape of their eyes and the fact that many of them are shorter than, let's say, the white man, but if that is true or not, I don't know because most of the greys are not even biological entities. This time, it worked much better. The Adapa was allowed to reproduce, under supervision, but just as with the first hybrids, they had their DNA deactivated to a large degree, and just like us, they used less than 5% of their brains on average. The gods did not want them to be like them, they didn't want them to start longing for eternal life and thirst for knowledge. They were slaves, period. They were smart enough to take orders, and execute them, but stupid enough not to ask intelligent questions. The majority of these experiments took place on Mars, and the workers were then transported from our sister planet down to Gaia. People have wondered why they bothered with that when they could do it all down here on our planet, and the answer is not clear. However, if I may make a qualified guess, it would be that they did not want Mother Gaia to know what they were doing with her nymphs until they were all ready for the mines, and then it was too late. From the Adapa, the AIF scientists did refinements and readjustments to their experiment as they went along, until they had the perfect worker, and the experiment stopped for a while. When the mining industry worked as it should, however, and more mines had been opened around the world, the next part of Enki's plan was executed, and that was to create soldiers, foot soldiers. Then, the whole genetic manipulation industry was taken to a new level. Enki wanted to create strong and enduring soldiers who were loyal to their masters and had the bravery of the DAKH warriors but were stronger and larger in size. Measurements were made in the atmosphere and in the electromagnetic field to determine how tall and how heavy these soldiers could be, if possible, he wanted to make them even stronger than the giants that he had created for the mining project that, unfortunately, had failed. However, if he moved the moon a little bit closer to Earth again, the planet could eventually be able to host some larger beings. That was done, and now Enki had an additional idea. By the time he fled from Orion, after he had been cast out of heaven, he created some giant hybrids in the Pleiades. These Pleiadian beings lived on larger planets than that of Gaia, and many of them were of impressive stature. Enki sent a message to them and invited some of them to come to Gaia, which they did. Just like the rest of the AIF, they were interdimensional beings and were able to nano-travel. However, According to the Pleiadians themselves, channeled by Barbara Marciniak, they also brought gigantic spaceships with them, which they parked in orbit around Earth. When the Pleiadians saw the women of Earth, the first thing they thought of was how beautiful they were. Many thought that the Earth women were the most beautiful women in their known universe and found them irresistible. In Level 2, I told the Pleiadians' own story from their lectures of how they started mating with the human women, and I suggested that these giant beings, although they could use their avatars to mate with our women, that was most likely not how it was done. A better hypothesis is that they took on human male bodies, either as babies, a human lifetime was nothing for them, or they became so-called walk-ins, where they took over a male body from an already occupied body, and either threw out the original soul essence or made them dormant while taking over the control of the body, however they did it, the earth women apparently found the male intruders attractive as well, and in their ignorance, they didn't mind copulating with them. If this is true, or only a made-up myth from the Pleiadians themselves in ancient times to justify their crime is difficult to say, but we also know that it was always considered an honor for a woman to sleep with one of the gods which of course is mind control and pure manipulation. There is a known fact by now, however, that at least some of the Pleiadians had a giant gene, and that gene was used in the genetic laboratories in order to create giants. 
Although the giant skulls and skeletons that have been found over the decades and the centuries all over the world are constantly being debunked by certain authorities, the fact remains that such remnants have been found. The museum outside Lima, Peru, carries typical examples of giant, elongated skulls that have been found, mostly in the Lima region. Complete giant graves have been found as well. Some of them have been raided over the years, but there are a few that are at least partly intact. Stephen Quayle, who has spent much of his life researching giants, has many interesting things to show on his website. Although some of the pictures he is showing are questionable, in my opinion, many of them are evidently authentic. Another excellent researcher on giant skulls, and giants in general, is Brian Forrester. Google him, and you will find some amazing videos. I have referred to him before. By mixing genes from the already existing Adapa and the Pleiadians, the giants of Genesis 6 in the Bible were created. Apparently, Enki and his team had a lot of fun with this because giants in all different sizes were suddenly walking the earth. Some of them became fearsome and furious warriors, others became some of the first kings to rule for the AIF in different parts of the world, while others became strong and excellent builders. In these days, Gaia was a strange planet to visit because there were a myriad of different experiments walking around on the planet at the same time, and many of these species did not get along very well with each other. Therefore, there were many wars between gods, men, and monsters. 